All right, hello and welcome to your last day of recorded lectures. Uh, there are going to be two videos for this day. Uh, I asked in the last video if people wanted one me to cover everything today or do a video on Monday. And all but one person who responded said do them all today. So you're going to have two videos. One's going to be on the Protestant Reformation and then there will be a second video on European exploration. So let's get started with this here. Um, the Reformation, it is the split in the Catholic Church. Um, if you're not Catholic today, but you are somebody who considers yourself Christian, uh, this probably has a lot to do with it. Um, now, the, what were the causes of the, of the Reformation? Well, the first one is the Black Plague. I didn't get a lot of time to cover this because, you know, time's limited with the online learning and everything. But the Black Plague killed a lot of people, especially clergy because the clergy are supposed to be the last ones to see uh, you before you die so you can give your last rites. That means that the priests and the other clergymen are the ones who are seeing you when you are the sickest. There's also that church versus state question. The church versus state question is still going on and you know, who has real power? Is it is it uh, the Pope? Is it a king? Uh, is it the religious leaders? Is it the secular leaders? So there's still that church versus state question of raging on. Then there's an event called the Babylonian Captivity. And if this was an in-class thing, I'd diagram all over the board and kind of explain what happened. But to make it really short, uh, from 1305 to 1314, uh, that's when the Babylonian Captivity happened. Uh, the French kidnapped the Pope and forced him to live in the city of Avignon uh, instead of in Rome. Now once the Babylonian captivity ended, uh, some of these popes following that Pope uh, chose to live in Avignon and there became this question of um, the Pope's supposed to be in Rome. If he's not in Rome, is he really the Pope? Well when you get to the late 14, or sorry, late 1300s, early 1400s, the Catholic Church, they're going to avoid, they're going to appoint a Roman Pope, even though there's already a Pope in Avignon. So we have two Popes instead of one, which is one Pope more than you're supposed to get. So there starts to be this argument about who is the real Pope. Now that's not going to be solved until 1417 at the Council of Constance. At the Council of Constance, there's not one, there's not two, but there are three people claiming to be Pope. Three popes go to the Council of Constance. Only one pope survive, and spoiler alert, it's not any of the three popes that entered. Now, nobody gets killed or anything like that, but one of the popes gets excommunicated. The other two popes quit, and then a brand new pope is elected by the Catholic Church. Now, there are some people you need to know who are going to bring on the Reformation. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. The first name you should know is John Wycliffe. He lived from 1328 to 1384. He was English. And the big points for him, he wanted the church to be stripped of property. He wanted to get rid of saints. And he wanted to get rid of the cult of Mary. He says none of those things are in the Bible, so we shouldn't be doing them. He also translated the Bible into English, which made the Catholic Church mad because suddenly all these Englishmen could read the Bible and realize that the Catholic Church didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, and the reason I say that is when the, the uh, Black Death happened, the Catholic Church had to hire so many people, so to speak, that it's estimated about 2% of the clergymen actually knew what was happening after the Catholic Church hired all these people. Now, he was originally supported by people who wanted church property. Eventually, he's going to be supported by peasants. And in 1381, uh, the peasant revolt is going to happen based on the ideas of John Wycliffe. And Wycliffe is going to be named an enemy of the state by the King of England. And to be a follower of Wycliffe meant you could be punished by death. You also have John Huss. John Huss, he was from a place called Bohemia, which is today the Czech Republic. And he was the personal confessor to Queen Anne of England. Now, Queen Anne was married to Richard II, King of England. 
Queen Anne's brother was the king of Bohemia, a guy named uh, Wenceslas. And when the king named John Wycliffe an enemy of the state, Queen Anne felt uh, fear for her life. And so she left her husband and went back to her brother in Bohemia for protection. When Queen Anne went back to Bohemia, John Huss went too. And he ended up leading the Hussite Revolt, which was a revolt against Catholics in Bohemia. Now, in the end, John Huss is going to be invited to the Council of Constance. His safety is guaranteed, but as soon as he gets there, he's arrested, he's tried, and he's convicted of being a heretic, and he's executed. Now, what happens after the death of John Huss uh, Bohemia, or the Czech Republic, defeats a Catholic army, and they're going to remain non-Catholic for a couple, uh, about 200 years, until the Thirty Years' War happens. Uh, we won't talk about Thirty Years' War in this class. That is a thing for world history, too. So sorry if you were looking forward to that. Now, what were the complaints against the church? Well, there's this idea of immorality. In the Catholic Church, priests and bishops and cardinals and even the pope are not supposed to have sex they're supposed to be celibate well that wasn't being enforced there were little kids belonging to priests running around europe and instead of stopping the practice the catholic church would just say hey give us some money and we'll, we'll pretend the problem doesn't exist you also have a lot of priests who were caught drinking and gambling ignorance as i said two percent of the clergy knew the catholic liturgy they knew what was happening and when the bible started to be translated into the common everyday languages people realized wow these catholic priests don't know anything there's this idea of pluralism uh, the simplest way i can put it is priests had multiple priesthoods uh, you could have been a priest in southern italy and then you could have also been given a church in northern sweden and you were getting paid for holding both of those offices. But you know as well as I do, somebody's not going to go all the way from southern Italy to northern Sweden. So priests would be double paid when they weren't doing double work. And then there's this idea of the indulgence. And I always like to explain it as a get out of hell free card. Uh, you could purchase this forgiveness. You didn't actually have to be sorry for your sin. You just had to have money. Uh, you could purchase a indulgence for something you've already done. You could purchase an indulgence for something you plan on doing. You could even purchase an indulgence for somebody who's dead. You could get an indulgence for your dear Aunt Sally because you don't know where she went, heaven or hell, or if she's stuck in purgatory. And if she died 20 years ago, if you bought an indulgence, you'd get her into heaven. So that was a big problem there. Now, Martin Luther is the big name when it comes to the Renaissance, and uh, he was a man who was originally supposed to be a lawyer, but after a storm hits and he's almost struck by lightning, he decides to dedicate his life to the Christian church. And he was initially taught that true repentance does not involve self-inflicted penances and punishments, but rather a change of heart. Basically, you don't have to be sorry, you don't have to feel bad, you just have to change your ways. Now, even after Martin Luther did everything he's supposed to do, even after he fasted, he prayed, he went to confession, he did all the stuff he's supposed to do, and he still felt like he had done something wrong. So eventually he comes up with this idea called justification by faith alone. And it's a major part of the Lutheran church today. To Martin Luther, salvation did not come from external forces. It came simply from faith in Christ. And faith is a gift from God that cannot be earned. You cannot work for it. You cannot do anything other than accept it. Once he comes up with his ideas, he's going to write down the 95 theses. And this is going to be a list of 95 things he disliked about the church and thought needed to be changed. Now, this is something you are supposed to read for this week, so I hope you have. Um, but they're put on the door of Wittenberg Castle on October 31st, 1517. And it's basically a list of challenges to the Pope. 
and it criticized the wealth of the Pope and it said the Pope's doing all this wrong and this is what needs to change. Now Luther is going to be declared a heretic by the Catholic Church. The Church is going to say that the authority is the Bible, church elders, and the Pope. There is more to religion than just faith. Luther is going to recognize only two sacraments, baptism and communion. Uh, the Catholic Church today recognizes seven. Luther is going to say there's no such thing as the cult of Mary, there's no such thing as purgatory, and there's no such thing as relics. Now, if you don't know what a relic is, it's supposed to be a uh, religious item. For example, during the days of Martin Luther, there was the head of St. John the Baptist that was supposed to be in Europe. Uh, did I say a head? There were actually 12 heads of St. John the Baptist floating around Europe. Now think about that. How can they prove any of those are the skull of St. John the Baptist? And even if they could, which of the 12 is the right one? So you can kind of see where Luther had a problem with that. And then Luther also rejected this idea of transubstantiation. If you've ever been to a Lutheran church or a uh, Catholic church, anything like that, um, occasionally Methodists do this and occasionally Baptists do this, but you have this idea of communion where you drink the blood of Christ and you eat the flesh of Christ. Well, Catholics at the time believed that when you ingested the bread or you ingested the wine, it turned into the blood or, fl or flesh of Christ. Luther says, no, 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 that's not what actually happens. It is completely um, symbolic. Now, the Pope is going to order the Holy Roman Emperor, a guy named Charles V, to capture Luther. Unfortunately, Charles V was busy in a war against the Ottoman Empire, and Luther was protected by his friend, Frederick III, who was a leader of a small kingdom called Saxony. Now, what's the impact of Luther? Well, initially, people in Germany thought this was going to unite Germany. But no, it has the exact opposite effect. In fact, Germany doesn't become a country until 1873. The biggest reason that this was not going to happen was the Peace of Augsburg. There was a religious war that happened that settled in the 1550s with the Peace of Augsburg. There's also the German Peasant Revolt of 1524. It's put down harshly. Over 100,000 peasants in German lands are killed. And what was the Peace of Augsburg? Well, put it simply, Germany was made up of dozens of independent little kingdoms, all led by a little prince or a little elector or some sort of royalty. And each of those German princes got to choose whether they wanted to be a Lutheran or a Catholic. Now, once that person chose what they wanted to be, everybody in the kingdom had to choose that religion too. So if the elector of Saxony wanted to become Lutheran, all of the people living in Saxony wanted to be a Lutheran. If the person in charge of, of uh, Bavaria wanted to become Catholic, everybody had to become Catholic. So it actually fractured Germany much more than it united them. German princes, they get really powerful out of this because they can control what religion you are or are not. Calvinism, founded by John Calvin. Um, they're a little bit harder to explain for me. Uh, and that's because of this idea of predestination. The best I've understood predestination from my research and from talking to people who are followers of Calvin and, and everything else and my experiences in the um, attending Calvinist churches, uh, you are either saved or you're damned before birth. All men inherit the sin of Adam and therefore they're damned no matter what they do. God saves some people before birth because he's a merciful God and there's nothing you can do on earth that can change your fate. Now that's where I got a little confused and I started asking questions about people. I've never had a religious studies class or anything like that. But apparently what happens in the, the Calvinist faith is that if you have turned to the church and if you accept Christianity, then you are one of those people who has been saved prior to birth. Because you're only going to turn to God if you are one chosen by God. 
Now, here in America, there are Calvinists, but they're known as Presbyterians. The same thing in Scotland. If you've ever taken U.S. history, the Puritans, those were Calvinists as well. And then in France, there was a group of people called Huguenots. The English Reformation, yes, you're getting more Reformations than you counted for. And this is a great place to put in the secret word. The English Reformation is a pretty short topic, but it's pretty cool. Um, but the secret word before I do that, it's going to be study. So your secret word is study. Um, that's because I want you to study for your final exam before you take it next week. So secret word is study. S-T-U-D-Y. All right, so I told you the English Reformation is pretty cool. I'm actually learning more and reading more about this as we speak. Um, just because the War of the Roses and everything, this whole section of English history is just cool to me. Um, so the War of the Roses was a fight between the Lancaster and the uh, the Plantagenets and the Tudors. There were three different branches of the same family. And the Tudor family is going to win the War of the Roses. And King Henry VIII is going to become the king of England after his dad, King Henry VII, the winner of the War of the Roses, dies. Now, King Henry VIII, he wants a son so he can make sure his heirs are monarchs because there'd never been a queen up to this point, although technically there had been, but, you know, details. Also, Henry VIII was never supposed to become king because he had an older brother. His older brother died, though. So he was worried that, you know, things can happen. I have to have a son to make sure that my heirs are, are going to be the king. Now, he was married to a woman named Catherine of Aragon, and he had to have a divorce from her because no matter what, Catherine and Henry could not have a son. Also, Henry wanted to have power, so he's going to rebel against the Pope. He's going to rebel against the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church would not annul his marriage. Now, there's a whole long story behind this. King Henry's older brother had actually married Catherine. Uh, Catherine and Henry's older brother never had sex or anything like that, so the marriage didn't count. And then Henry marries his brother's ex, and then down the line, once Henry realizes he's not going to have a son with Catherine, then he tries to say, oh wait, my older brother and Catherine did sleep together, even though it was proven beyond a doubt that they couldn't have. So it's a long story there, and that's kind of what makes this really cool. Now, Henry VIII had a lot of wives. Uh, Catherine of Aragon, that was wife number one. Their marriage ends in divorce, but really it's called an annulment. Then you have Anne Boleyn, who was one of the ladies-in-waiting, meaning one of the servant girls of Catherine of Aragon. Um, that marriage ends up in death. Henry has her beheaded. Jane Seymour, who was a friend of Anne Boleyn, she dies after she gives birth to a son named Edward. Then you got Anna Cleves. Um, Henry kind of doesn't like her and has the marriage annulled very shortly after they're married. Then you got Catherine Howard, who was beheaded because she actually did commit adultery. And then Catherine Parr was friends with Henry's oldest daughter, Mary, and she actually outlives Henry VIII. Now, she was almost killed, but at the last minute he kind of um, said, no, I, I don't want to kill you. And Henry does have three kids. He's got Mary, who is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. He's got Elizabeth, who is the daughter of Anne Boleyn. And then son, Jane Seymour. Or son, Edward, who's this um, product of Jane Seymour. Now, Henry leaving the Catholic Church works like this. Henry's going to ask the Pope for permission for a divorce. The Pope says no. The P Henry is going to excommunicate the Pope name himself the head of the church, and he names his church the Anglican Church. Now, this means anybody who disagrees with what he's doing is disagreeing with the king, and that is a uh, capital offense. You could be killed for disagreeing with the king. 
Henry's also going to dissolve the monasteries. He's going to give all the land to his friends because that way, if something happens, the Catholic Church is going to have a really hard time getting their land back. And then he's going to make a deal with Parliament where he says, hey, if you make this all okay, if you go along with it, I'll give up some of my power. Now, when you get down to it, Henry's church was still Catholic, just without a pope. Uh, there are going to be eventually some Protestant ideas that are brought in, but it takes a little while. And the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and the Episcopalian Church are all the same thing. And it's still very, very much Catholic-based. I have a very good friend who is Catholic, was raised Catholic. He married a woman who is an Episcopalian, so he goes to an Episcopalian church now, and he says it's Catholic light. He does almost the exact same thing he did when he was growing up. So what happens after Henry VIII? Well, you got Queen Mary I. She tries to bring Catholicism back. Uh, she went out and murdered anybody who helped her mom and dad separate. And then she married uh, the Spanish king that led to a war between France and Spain and England and all this other stuff. Afterward, uh, you got Queen Elizabeth, who was Mary's half-sister. She tries to find this middle ground between Protestantism and Catholicism. And her biggest claim to fame is she uh, develops the Articles of Faith. The Articles of Faith, it says that you have to attend a, cat, uh, a Church of England service, but anything you do behind your closed doors is fine. If you want to be a closet Catholic, that's okay. Just go to a Church of England service, look good on paper, and then do whatever you want in your private life. Her main thing was loyalty. Now you might notice, I don't have Edward in there. Why? Because Edward dies before he turns 18. Uh, Edward dies, he does become king, and um, he dies very young. He was sick as a kid, and um, that's how Mary becomes queen, is because Edward dies and there's nobody else. So they say, we got no choice, Mary's got to be the next leader. Catholic Reformation, this one is really easy. It's only one slide. The Catholic Reformation is going to take place at the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent goes from 1545 to 1563. And the simplest way I can say it is the Catholic Church says they're right, everybody else is wrong. They say yes to justification by faith, yes to justification by good works, meaning you have to work for salvation, it's not just given. Um, the Bible is not the sole source of authority. You have to have the church. You have to have the Pope. It also says the cult of Mary. That's good. Saints. That's good. Pilgrimages. Yep. That's good. Everything we're doing is right. The two places where the Catholic church does agree to change, they're going to create some religious orders. They're going to create two orders of nuns, the Ursulines and the Carmelites. The Ursuline nuns, they are uh, all about education, so they can train future generations of Catholics. And then the Carmelites, they're going to be nuns who live in poverty just to show that the Catholic Church cares about the poor people too. Then you also have the Society of Jesus. This one's, this is probably the most important thing to come out of the Catholic Church since the 1500s. The Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, they're created by Ignatius Loyola. And I always say that they're the stormtroopers. They're the, uh, they're the uh, stormtroopers of the Catholic Church. Whenever the Catholic Church needs something done or needs somebody to be converted into Catholicism, the Jesuits are there. The Jesuits go to South America, North America, Asia. The Jesuits go to Africa. They're the stormtroopers. They're the ones who spread the, cat the Catholic ideas. The Jesuits are going to become confessors to kings. The Jesuits are going to do missionary work. They're going to create schools. They're going to do all of this stuff. So, yeah, the Jesuits are probably the most important thing to come out of this because they're going to affect a lot of stuff. All right, so that is your whirlwind tour of Catholicism and Protestantism and how that separation happens. I also mentioned in there a little bit about the Catholic or the not the Catholic Reformation, but the English Reformation, which is technically a Protestant Reformation, but in reality it's kind of in between the two. Okay, so that's it for this video. I have to stop this and then go and make your European exploration video. So we'll talk to you in a few minutes. Bye-bye.